is Mrs. Jane Hunley from the Senior Source. She's going to do an amazing presentation for us this evening, uh, just really going over some great communication tips to really keep your relationship fulfilling and um, meaningful as changes in your intimate relationships occur. So Jane, I'm going to kick it off to you. I thank you so much, Tanisha, for bringing this program to us this evening. And I'm going to work to begin my slides uh, so I can start. I'm having a little trouble with the top for just a moment. There we go. Slideshow and let's see if we can start it off from the beginning. Okay, can you all see and hear me just fine? Yes, ma'am. The slides. Thank you again, Tanisha. Um, I have kind of two hats tonight. I am a, a social worker who's a caregiver specialist for the senior source, and I also serve as a volunteer educator for the Alzheimer's Association. And so it is my pleasure to speak to groups frequently, but very rarely on this topic. And so I think it's really important to say that we often do not bring topics related to intimacy um, into open forums and even less frequently do we talk about intimacy as it relates to dementia and changing relationships. So thank you all. We, uh, we are very glad that you have uh, put this together. Basically my portion today is to cover a bit on communication changes as they take place over the course of the, the disease of dementia to really look at how the verbal and behavioral signals and messages that are delivered by the person with dementia can be better understood and how we can respond in a more helpful manner. And then I will begin to discuss a few strategies for connecting and communicating, but AG and Holly will also take that to uh, the next level for us. So as we talk about communication, I wanna stop here for a moment and just say, when we discuss um, intimacy, we often think of just the sexual relationship, but intimacy is so much broader and communication is a large component of that. So if we think about the foundation of intimacy, most of us would agree that is foundational in terms of a relationship. And foundational in terms of a relationship is communication. And so it all comes together when we have a higher level of communication in a relationship, we tend to have um, more satisfying and a higher level of intimacy. So if we also think about role changes throughout the lifespan, the roles we play at 10 are very different than 30, than 50 and 80. And as we age and we work with older adults and, out, and we are caring for older adults, it is much more common to hear people talk about role rehearsal. Oh my goodness, I never did this. I never had to take care of mom. She always took care of me. So it's important to recognize that we may go through some role reversal as we are caring for individuals with dementia. Um, some individuals uh, have a bigger impact on their relationship re related to the role changes than others. So I'll tell you about a gentleman I'm working with right now who's an 81-year-old um, retired gentleman, and he talks just with just great joy about caring for his spouse of 61 years with dementia. He says, she took care of us and the whole family so well, so long. It was so great, and I am so pleased now to take care of my queen. And he talks about that frequently and the joy he is finding in caring for her. On the other hand, I have a caregiver who says literally to me, I just can't take it anymore. I've never done these things. I've never taken the car to get the oil changed. I've never arranged to have the eaves cleaned. I've never. And she says, I am so tired, frustrated, depressed, angry, and lonely. And so you see in these two cases, just the impact of the dementia, dementia illness in terms of the relationships in those families. And so we are working to help caregivers and ourselves overcome kind of those conflicts, um, find support and really find that joy of, of taking care of mom or the queen or our, our 
our partner. When we think about intimacy, we know all of us have needs and wishes for friendship, belonging, companionship, intimacy, and expression of our sexuality. These can be um, related to handholding, sharing feelings, not just sexual intercourse. When you introduce dementia into a partnership, so a spousal or a partner relationship, um, it does affect how we feel and act. And so as we express our need for companionship and intimacy in this relationship with someone who now has cognitive impairment, it is going to be a bit different. Some individuals with dementia may become more open or more interested in sexual activity. Some are going to be the opposite. They may be less affectionate. It's really important for us to remember that that reflects the changes that are going on in your brain that that impacts the actions and the words that they display. Sexual behavior may become much more unpredictable and hard to understand. At some point, the person may not recognize their partner. That is a point where it's particularly painful often for the partner, and we try to prepare individuals in advance for that. Some folks have already had a change in their sexual relationship due to illness, um, joint issues, hormonal changes, some will find that that, along with caregiving, decreases sexual interest, while others, and particularly certain types of dementia, may actually have an impact where there are less inhibitions, and so they may have an increased um, interest in sex. They may display behavior that they've never displayed, flirting with strangers in public, undressing, um, talking about things that they have never talked about. So the most important piece is for us to keep an open mind and to encourage, whether we are the caregiver, we are working with caregivers, for them to be comfortable as early in the process as possible in terms of talking about intimacy and sexuality. Every day I talk to caregivers about planning ahead, plan ahead for legal, plan ahead for financial, but rarely do I say, okay, now let's talk about the nature of the relationship. This relationship is going to change. And so I too need to listen tonight and to learn from the, the presenters who come after myself in terms of how I approach that more openly and directly with the individuals that I'm supporting. So with that part kind of as a frame to move forward, the rest of this presentation was developed by the Alzheimer's Association. We will touch on every slide, not every video, but we will touch on every slide just to kind of give us an overview of what to expect. So we'll begin with kind of general communication changes, which the early stages of a an illness of dementia. Sometimes there are issues where someone has difficulty conveying thoughts and feelings through just language. So there may be some basic language changes. They may have more difficulty um, making a decision quickly, but they are still able to participate in decision-making often. And so that's why we encourage early diagnosis. We encourage individuals, as soon as a diagnosis is made, to sit down and communicate with the person with cognitive impairment about their future choices so that they have um, the option to tell us now how they feel about something and we show the respect of including them in that. During a moderate or the middle stage, <clears throat> it's more common for just basic words to be used, basic sentences. We will need to rely more on our tone of voice and our body and our expression, but continue to find new and appropriate ways to have that emotional connection and to bring meaning to that individual and to their life and their activities. By the late stage, it may be much more challenging to use normal um, spoken communication with someone and we'll talk about how to use the senses to increase um, those opportunities. So can you all see the top of this so you can see communication in the early stages? Common changes you may find are some difficulty in finding the right words. So you may notice someone with an early stage Alzheimer's or dementia 
kind of grasping for a word, maybe taking longer to answer a question or to speak. Sometimes you see someone become withdrawn from a conversation because they just can't grasp everything to participate at the level that they did before. And then there may be some difficulty in terms of um, assimilating so that they can make decisions and problem solve in the way that they did before. Martha is going to share with us um, a general video about the first stage. Communicating in the early stages of dementia with the person with the disease is important. Um, at that time, you still have language as a tool. So you can learn things about what they might prefer as the disease progresses. Uh, for example, as the disease progresses, a person might have difficulty finding words. Caregivers often struggle to know what to do in that moment. Early on in the disease, you can ask. You can say, you know, if you ever have trouble coming up with the word, would you rather that I jump in and give you the word, or do you want me to wait and allow you some time so you can find it on your own? So as we process what Martha just said in relationship to our topic tonight, I think we can interject if it's okay to ask, and it is in, with someone in an early stage, what do you think about something? Do you want me to fill in a word for you? Do you want me to wait? What do you think about our living situation? Is this comfortable for you? What kind of legal plans do you want to make? It is also okay for the partner to say, as our relationship um, issue, you know, we are going to deal with relationship issues and possibly sexual issues as the disease progresses, but we will find ways to continue to communicate. What do you think you would want? And so we can be direct as we are in other things. So to communicate best in the early stages of dementia with someone, we want to ask them how to help with their communication. We want to keep our communication really pretty simple and straightforward um, without a lot of nuance and give extra time for them to respond. We want to include them in the conversation very much so, um, so that we show that respect to them. We want to avoid assumptions. Um, you're never certain unless you ask. Speak to the person in a manner in which they're comfortable. And I think this is easiest for partners because we're usually living together so that we can um, laugh together, we can be open, and we can spend that time that fosters communication. So as we move to the middle stage, changes that you may notice in a person with cognitive impairment are an increased difficulty in finding the right word. Often you'll see this first with a noun. Someone may say that thing and they'll point to something and it's common like a chair or refrigerator and you know that it is becoming more difficult for them to find the correct word. Again, we may see repetition. So using the same word or asking the same question you may use a word that doesn't really make any sense, may lose their train of thought. Um, Often you'll see folks speaking less frequently, again, because they are beginning to withdraw a little bit. There's some often recognition that they can't participate as easily in a conversation and they're uncomfortable, so they may speak uh, much less. However, behavior um, speaks volumes to us as we begin to learn what a behavioral sign means. So maybe someone is becoming agitated or they're groping at their clothing or their private parts. Maybe they simply need to go to the restroom. Maybe they need to be, um, maybe the temperature is too warm. And so you learn to judge those kind of behaviors that you see someone exhibit when they're not as comfortable as they are or as relaxed. We always share with um, all caregivers, please, please call the doctor when there's a drastic change because that is never a normal part of progressive dementia. That often signals um, illness and you do want to consult with your doctor. Beverly is, is a support group uh, leader and she has some interesting things to say. I would advise 
couples, and I usually do advise the caregiver who comes to the group and is caring for a spouse, that you take your time. Always count to three before you respond because it gives you time to think about your answer and what's going on. Generally, in a marital dispute, it's quick. It's just back and forth. You're quick to give an answer. When they've been diagnosed, to sit back and say, okay, you're supposed to be the one that's reasonable here. Let's change how we do this because there's only one thing you can control, and that's you. You cannot control them and their process. So as we kind of look at what Beverly has told us in terms of our topic tonight, I think it's really, um, she gave us some pearls. She says three seconds, I say 33. Um, we know that in a close relationship, but certainly one with a partner or spouse, that it is much easier to, to snap. And that is so quickly read by a person with dementia. It's not often what we say, it is how our behavior displays. And so she really gave us some really strong advice that we can also utilize in the topic of intimacy because when we snap, that kind of erodes the communication, the comfort of that person, and may actually result in them having anxiety and agitation. Our role as caregivers is to try to facilitate a calm, loving, supportive environment. And so counting to three or 33, um, thank you, Beverly, for that idea. So as we communicate with someone who is in the middle stage of a dementia, it's, it's best to, to continue to use their name a lot. People remember their name for a long period of time and it's comforting to hear their name. This is eye contact and seating. I like to just say in general, get with the person on their level. You know, if they're sitting, sit down. It's much less threatening than having somebody talking to you, standing over you. Always avoid criticizing, correcting, arguing. Um, pay attention to tone and take your time. So my example is when I'm working and I'm not talking to a client, I'm going 90 miles an hour and I talk very fast and you hear the change in my tone as I try to do a presentation or talk with a client in that I'm much slower and my tone is much calmer and more reassuring. So it helps me and I have to kind of in my head always remind myself, sit down, take a deep breath, monitor my tone and my tempo and that will be helpful to the person because they will assume some of our emotion. And if it's escalated, they may also assume that. We're going to skip this video, We're going to go on to um, the last few suggestions about communication in the middle stage. We always want to show respect and empathy. So we're gonna look at the person's needs. As I said, when someone is not acting as they normally would, is it a change or does it reflect a need of theirs? If they are pacing in the house, um, if they are grappling at the bed sheets, is there something else going on? Are they ill? Do they lack enough activity and meaningful um, things to do? So assess their needs, you know, hear their concerns. Hey, you know, can I help you? Observe their behavior, be aware of your own behavior. But above all, always think about the emotion behind their actions and behavior and also yours. So the last is just um, as the disease progresses, you and I can really work on our language. We slow it down, it becomes more basic. We don't ask lots and lots of questions. We limit the number of distractions. We limit the number of options. We increase our patient's level a great deal. We can also give the individual cues and so in an intimate relationship, um, hand holding, um, we'll talk a little bit about hand massage, um, some, you know, an arm around someone watching television. There are um, many ways that we can use our behavioral cues um, that may be helpful to them. You don't wanna do sudden movements if possible. 
Um, we don't want to snap in that uh, relationship. Uh, and we certainly, as I said, repeat things patiently as needed. If possible, turn negatives into positives. And we have a, a line that we'll often use with caregivers, yes and. So when somebody will say, but mom's coming over to dinner and you know mom has been gone for a long time. Yes, and let's go find a picture of her. Let's talk about her so that you can turn it into a positive as opposed to no, she's not and you know she's gone. Um, the other thing, and I just mentioned this, but is to avoid quizzing. So lots and lots of questions are really difficult with somebody by this stage and you want to limit those. One question at a time, very slow. Set the person up for success and you will uh, increase your likelihood of success as well. Um, overall, the commonality throughout these is that you and I need to learn to join the person's reality. Where are they right now? Understand where they are in their functioning, what they wanted when we did talk with them, provide reassurance and understanding and really focus on their feelings and validate them. So the late stage um, will have most often some very significant changes in terms of communication. And this is um, often very challenging for individuals because the person with dementia now be, may be only able to use a few words or phrases. Um, sometimes they'll be familiar ones, but the, it is um, often pronounced they may not recognize their partner at this stage, and so they may call them by another name or not at all. Um, they may actually call someone else a partner's name, and that's a particularly painful sometimes for the partner, and again, why we prepare them for these things. And so, again, we want to look for um, behavior changes that may indicate the person is uncomfortable in pain. We want to rectify that situation quickly if we can. Do they need to go to the restroom? Um, are they cold? Are they hot? Are their clothing too, um, too tight? We are trying at this point to help this person be comfortable and happy because that helps us as caregivers be comfortable and happy. Um, we do wanna keep talking and then we can take some tips that the next few slides will share where we need to really broaden our thoughts on communication, because it's not just what comes out of our mouth. Um, there are other certain ways to communicate. And this program really looks at um, using the five senses. And so Sandra's gonna start us off. I know that my mom feels aggravated. I know that she feels alone. I know that she feels confused. And I know on any given day, I don't know if I've made it better for her. I try. In these later stages, I've come to recognize that being really aware of the five senses is really important. Touch seems to give her a great deal of comfort. I know when I come over, I'm going to brush her hair all the time. My husband noted to me recently, he said, you know, you should see the look on your mom's face when you're brushing her hair. She's just happy. She's just happy. She doesn't say a lot. And I do it for a long period of time. I comb it, I braid it, I do funny things with it, but it just allows me to just be with her in a way that makes her feel comfortable. So I really love what Sandra said because it helps us start to think in different ways. Um, often in a mother-daughter relationship, we think of intimacy as sharing every little thought and feeling and what we've done, but that her mother is no longer to able to participate in that way, and she has found another way to connect and still maintain that intimate relationship. So as we look through the five senses in terms of communication with someone who has quite advanced cognitive impairment, we can use a lot of different things. One of the things that is really promoted in caregiver classes, particularly with late stage, are hand massages. Get the lotion, start doing a hand massage. And I think Holly will speak a little bit more to that later, but just think about broadly how you can use that sense of touch. Uh, hold hands, um, brush someone's hair. In terms of the sense of sight, I love to use pictures, but I think there's also some times where um, something that is not frightening on television um, that might be humorous, 
has a great visual impact. Um, getting outside is a really exciting thing um, for folks. If the person is still able to walk, it gives you a double benefit, enjoy nature, but also um, get outside um, and get exercise. We have some really wonderful programs in um, our community that focus on this. One is um, our local Arboretum sponsors a program for individuals, uh, caregivers, and the person with um, dementia where they can tour in the Arboretum with a guide in a very small number. We also have a brand new program being launched by one of our health systems that is using art and music um, in a way to allow caregivers to utilize multiple senses, but also to find new meaningful activity with that person. Because I, I'm a big reader and a big crossword puzzle um, person, but at some point, you know, my partner may need to look for other avenues and new meaningful activities for me. In terms of sound, I think this is the one we often go to um, after we go to um, just regular communication because music is so powerful. There are so many kinds of music. Most of us have access to playing um, music at this point. Uh, you could try the records that the person enjoyed. It may take the partner back with you to a really good, happy time. Even if they don't remember exactly the memory of the relationship, then it may bring a smile to their face. Sometimes we read to the person, which can also be a really meaningful activity and is still showing connection and gives both of you, um, you know, a really um, good time together and, and some kind of a meaningful activity. Obviously, tone of voice, always important. Smell, I like to put something on the stove that <clears throat> maybe the person um, baked themselves or cooked themselves and it just evokes a really positive response. Some of our caregivers um, like to use essential oils. It's really um, promoted in terms of caregiver wellness as a stress management technique, but also can be really helpful in terms of providing um, a stressful, uh, a, a decreasing in stress for the person with dementia. You see hand massages and lotions mentioned here again. Taste, of course, um, we can't forget, and I'm a little chocoholic, and I surely hope if at some point I develop dementia that I still love my chocolate, but it's possible that's not the case. And so you will trial and error and find things that the person can enjoy, and again, you can turn that into an activity, but you're connecting with the person. You're finding new ways to communicate, connect, and to bring some happiness to them. As we finish, kind of the overall um, recommendations are join the person's reality. And that's going to be very different in an early stage where they can still talk with you, tell you their preferences than it is in a late stage when you will be looking and planning meaningful activity for the person. Understand and accept what you can and cannot change. When brain cells are changing, we are not presently able to fix that but we can certainly respond in terms of how we manage that, how we answer, how we count to three and allow that person that kind of respect. Show their respect through our feelings and our tone of voice. Watch the person's communication to learn or de decode what that means. What's, what would be have been the words they would have used that they can no longer use, but you may be able to discern that from their behavior and actions. Um, our mood and actions is going to say a lot to that person. So we want to help meet their needs with a soothing and calming manner that we can. I'm going to skip over this video, but Dr. Fazio essentially is talking about care for the caregiver. And we stress that so much in terms of dementia care. We always feel we are working with two individuals and they are equally important. So I cannot stress enough that um, we want to build up our caregivers. We want to educate them, we want to direct them and we want to support them. And so as we prepare to move to the next section, I do want to mention on behalf of the Alzheimer's Association, the scores of resources they have that you and I can use um, to support ourselves and also to share with our caregivers, also to share with persons who are in the early stage of dementia. Um, and with that, 
the really um, significant questions as they relate to intimacy and dementia that range from consent um, to what other activities can you undertake are going to be shared next by A.G. and Holly. Um, again, Tanisha, I thank you for this, um, this time. Thank you so much, Jane. That was just a wonderful presentation, some great information and a great segue into our next session. So I would like to introduce Holly Glover and A.G. Black. Holly is the Director of Education and Caregiver Support Services at the James L. West Center for Dementia in Fort Worth. And A.G. is a long-term care ombudsman with the Senior Source of Dallas. And uh, what we're gonna do for this section is A.G. and Holly are going to first give us a brief overview of some great topics. And then we will start with some pre-selected questions that we've gotten from registrants and also some questions that we've selected Selected for each of them. And then please, please flood the chat. We would love to have some questions from the audience. My colleague Kelly Wilmore will be feeding those questions and communicating with you in the chat. So to kick off our panel discussion, Holly, I'm going to start with you and then AG, you're going to be soon to follow. All right. Thanks, Tanisha. Let me share my screen real quick. All right, is that good? Yes, ma'am. All right, thanks. So I'm, I'm going to say several of the things that you heard earlier. We do know you've got to hear things seven times to make sure that they stick up there. So some of this may be repeated, but first of all, we are all sexual beings. We're all sexual beings. Our parents are sexual beings. I know that makes some of us want to go, oh, no, 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 no. Yes, they are. They are sexual beings. And that doesn't go away because of a diagnosis of dementia. One of the things that you heard earlier, uh, but this was uh, found in the Family Caregiver Alliance, they found that the subject of intimacy rarely comes up in conversations with professionals who deal with patients and caregivers of those with dementia. It is thought to be a taboo subject. And so that is one of the reasons that we did want to do this program today is to uh, talk about uh, this subject. Now, one of the things that may happen is you may find that you are no longer interested in sexual intimacy or your loved one may no longer be in interested in sexual intimacy, or they may no longer be able to perform. And there's different reasons for that. But what you do together sexually is going to change throughout the course of this disease. It's also very common, especially earlier in the disease, for both of you to feel guilty, to feel anger, to feel rejection, and to feel some shame. And so we're gonna talk through some of those things. One of the things we're gonna do is we're gonna try not to take this personally. This is so hard as we walk through this journey with our loved one, trying not to take it personally and trying to understand the disease process. Now, another thing to keep in mind, if you're an adult child and you're taking care of a parent, it is very different from a spouse taking care of their spouse. I've had to have a lot of conversations with adult children because they're not understanding why their other parent is grieving the loss of their spouse the way that they are. And I have to stop and sometimes tell them, okay, you're grieving the loss of a parent. They're grieving the loss of the person that they have been passionate about their entire life. So stop and think of it that way. If this were you and your partner that this was happening to, we've got to have the empathy and we've got to stand in the shoes of that other person, especially if we are those adult children and both of our parents are still alive. So kind of coming alongside them and never telling someone how they should grieve. And that's exactly what's happening. And on this third bullet point I've got, one of the things that we grieve is the loss of the sexual relationship. It's a major part of our life. Um, and so we do, as we lose that part, we will grieve the loss of that part of the relationship. And we need to call it what it is. In counseling, we say, if you can name it, you can tame it. And so if we can call it what it is, we are grieving the loss of the relationship. It's going to change. It's not that it's going away. It's just that it's going to change. 
And finally, just as part of my overview, I also wanted to point out that early in the disease process, um, everybody knows that something's going on, just like we all know whenever something is going on in our body. And so we will see some self-esteem um, issues from the person with dementia. They're going to really suffer with that. They are afraid, they're worried, they're depressed, they're angry, and they're suffering. Uh, one of the, I've got a sign here in my office that says the dementia patient is not uh, giving you a hard time, the dementia patient's having a hard time. And if we can always kind of keep that in our mind and they can't accommodate the disease, we have to accommodate the disease. And what you're doing that right now by educating yourself, you are accommodating the disease by learning as much as you possibly can about this. Um, so as our role changes from partner to caregiver, this changes our relationship. It's okay to have those conflicting feelings. And again, we'll talk more about this as the evening goes on. So let me stop sharing and let AG do his overview. Okay, well, I'm basically gonna be talking about the whole idea of what happens with this person when they go into long-term care. Um, and there are 1.4 million people in nursing homes in the United States. And research shows that 70% of the population will at some point need long-term care. Um, it may be re rehabilitation that goes beyond a short rehabilitation stage, but still that's a, that's a lot of people that are gonna end up in a congregate institutional feeling setting. And sexuality and intimacy are fundamental to an individual, intrinsic to a person's self and well-being. And at any age, elder or not, we require companionship, intimacy, and love. It's a basic human need. And that human need doesn't go away just because we've gone into a nursing home or into assisted living. Um, I'm gonna share with you some of the things that I have actually had staff in facilities say to me um, to show you kind of the thought and some of the roadblocks that we navigate as advocates for people in long-term care. Um, older people do not have sexual desire. They're physically unattractive, therefore they're sexually undesirable. Um, elderly people who claim to be sexually active are fantasizing. Um, any display of sexuality by an older person is embarrassing and perverse. And my all-time favorite, sex is for the young only. Um, those are things I have actually heard. The thing, though, about people going into long-term care is they are going into that setting carrying with them all the human and civil rights that were afforded to them when they were living in the community, um, they carry in with them. But they also then get what are called resident rights that are codified in the Texas Administrative Code that regulates long-term care facilities. And one of those rights is the right to privacy. And so people have the right to whatever privacy needs that they, they have, even if it is in a congregate setting. Um, the, the whole idea that we deal with as ombudsman is trying to break down the stereotypes. Um, being open about communication and especially making sure that individual choices are uh, listened to and we give people those choices and plan around them. Now, a big, huge piece of long-term care and the staff that are caring for people that comes up when it comes to the topic of sexuality and intimacy is capacity. And simply having a diagnosis of dementia does not mean that someone lacks the mental capacity to make their own decisions and to understand the implication of those decisions. Capacity is always specific 
to a particular decision at a particular time. For example, someone may not have the capacity to make a decision about receiving a new medication, but that doesn't automatically mean that they lack the capacity to make a decision about something else. Um, the ability of a person to understand the implications of a decision may also vary on different occasions. It's most important to consider whether the person with dementia has the ability to recognize who the other person is, and most importantly, whether they have the ability to say no or to express their wishes in other ways if they don't have language. So who, who can determine a resident's ability to consent in long-term care? Well, first and foremost, it should never be any single individual making that decision for another about intimate relationships or intimacy. The resident's team, those people that work with them, that's the nurses, that's the doctor, that's therapists, anyone that works with that person need to be using assessments, data-driven assessments, to really be looking at the, le the resident's level of capacity to determine benefits and, and potential harm. So a director of nursing in a facility can't say, well, this person can't have sex because if they have sex, I'll lose my license. First of all, they won't, uh, but I hear that a lot. And that, that means you've got one person making the decision for everybody in the building. And that's not the way you go about figuring out a person's mental capacity in long-term care. Um, long-term care facilities have two primary obligations to residents concerning intimacy, and that is rights versus protection. Rights is meaning allowing people who have the capacity to consent to exercise their right to engage in physical relationships, whatever that means. It could be touching, it could be snuggling. It doesn't necessarily have to mean intercourse. Um, versus protection. And the protection part is just making sure that the vulnerable adults who are incapable of consenting to make sure that they are not being sexually exploited and abused. So facilities walk a real tightrope here, but there are some good guidelines for them if they'll just use them so that they're not blank, making blanket decisions about people rather than taking them in each individual circumstance. And the last thing I've got is just everyone is an individual every situation is unique, and there is not a one-size-fits-all facility policy <laughs> that will answer or address intimacy needs for the people that live there. And that's the thing that we have to keep in mind all the time when we're advocating for people who want to have the privacy um, in, a, in a facility. So, Tanisha, I'm kind of done. <laughs> That was my overview. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you both so much. Fantastic information, great overviews that are gonna give us, I think will give us some definitely some great questions. We already have questions in the chat forming. So first we are going to start with some pre-selected questions and I will start with you, Holly. Um, how do you obtain a dementia diagnosis and is it necessary? Sure, great question. This, we could ask this question an awful lot. We could ask this question all the time. So to get a dementia diagnosis, we're always going to start with our primary care physician because there are things that can mimic dementia. Dementia um, does not mean memory loss. And most people use those words interchangeably. A person can actually be diagnosed with dementia and not even have any memory loss because there are different types of dementia that can present with no memory loss. So the first place we want to start is with a primary care physician because we want to rule out things that mimic dementia like 
They may be malnourished. They may have a vitamin deficiency. They may have a, have a thyroid issue. They may be really, really depressed. And that can mimic some of the symptoms of dementia. So we start with our primary care physician uh, and we rule out all of that. And then we go to the neurologist. And at the neurologist, they will be able to run some more tests. They may send you on to someone else. Usually though, at the neurologist, uh, you can get a, a pretty firm diagnosis. And then the question of, do we need to be diagnosed? Do we need to know what kind or type? And just to back up a minute, that word dementia is an umbrella term, just like the word cancer is an umbrella term. We would then say what kind or type of dementia. There's over 130 different types of dementia. We see eight to 10 of them over and over again. But do we need to know what kind or type? Uh, and some people will say yes, and some people will say no. We're going to treat the symptoms because that's all we can do is treat the symptoms. But if it is something like a Lewy body type dementia, then that's going to be treated in a different way than maybe a frontotemporal disorder or a Parkinson's uh, disease dementia. So most folks will go ahead and get a, a, a diagnosis and, and it can be done now where there was a time when we couldn't get a firm diagnosis. We can now. Thank you so much. And just to add to that caveat, and then I'm going to have a question for AG. What is the typical age group uh, that you're sure. seeing people being diagnosed with Alzheimer's? And other yeah, cases? so typical, at di we will see people, uh, and this is not just a old person's disease. We hear that an Correct. awful lot. Correct. However, we do see uh, average age at diagnosis is about 80. But that being said, we have got a whole group of folks that get diagnosed before the age of 65. And when they're diagnosed before the age of 65, that is called early onset dementia. They do have a shorter life expectancy. The disease does tend to move faster in people who are diagnosed younger. I personally know of someone in Fort Worth who was diagnosed at 32. There was a man in McKinney, Texas that was diagnosed at 28. Um, and I had someone in my day program when we were open that was 47 years old and had early onset Alzheimer's. So it can happen at any time. Now, those folks, the younger they are, they do tend to get misdiagnosed because who's going to stop to think dementia with a 47 year old? They're going to get misdiagnosed uh, many times and it may take a very long time for them to get a proper diagnosis. Thank you so much. That, that's a very good point. Uh, that is one of the biggest misconceptions about uh, someone living with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, another type of dementia that is, first of all, a normal part of aging, which we know it's not, but also that it's a senior's, just a senior's disease. When we are seeing a growing number of people who are living with this diagnosis much younger, yep. uh, wow, in their 30s and late 20s, that's you know, that, that is some eye-opening information. Thank you so much, Holly. AG, uh, I have a question for you. Well, actually, it's a two-part question. Can you tell me a little bit about the Ombudsman program at the Senior Source? And also, how does the Ombudsman, uh, how does an Ombudsman work with a facility when it comes to really addressing sexual expression or even capacity, as you mentioned, with the person who is living with a form of dementia in a living facility? Okay. Um, well, first of all, the Ombudsman program is uh, federally mandated uh, by the, and was federally mandated in the Older Americans Act of 1967. And every skilled nursing facility and assisted living facility that is certified has to have an assigned Ombudsman. And that's in the United States. Um, the thing that uh, for us, we and oh, it also has to be independent of any other state agency because we have to be true third party, not beholden to anybody advocates for the people that are in long-term care. Um, for the Dallas County program, it's actually housed at the Senior Source. It's one of the eight programs that the Senior Source has. We have nine full-time staff uh, and approximately 15 active certified volunteers that have to go through all the training that we go through. Um, and we cover 81 
nursing facilities and 234 assisted living facilities in Dallas. We make unannounced visits at least, and I'm, I'm giving you the non-pandemic version uh, <laughs> because um, although we are almost back to non-pandemic times, uh, we're, we're close, but we make unannounced visits once a month at minimum to every one of those nursing facilities. We are basically making sure that the services uh, that the person is either required to receive or needs to receive that they're getting them, but we also check to make sure that their rights are being protected. And uh, if not, we are resident directed, resident centered, and if the resident gives us just verbal consent to work on something, we go to work to try and get it resolved for them. We also do a lot in assisting people in the community in seeking placement in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. We have a lot of material that we can give people about what to look for, what questions to ask. We can even narrow their search given as much specific information about their loved one as we can get. The one thing we cannot do is we cannot recommend one facility over another. Um, then the last thing that we do a lot of is we represent residents when they are being involuntary, involuntarily discharged from nursing homes. In fact, I have a fair hearing in the morning at 9 a.m. for someone who is being, um, has gotten a discharge notice and she wants to appeal it. So I'm gonna represent her in the morning. Um, so that's pretty much the program. As far as working with nursing homes, one of the first things I do and that we, and I sh should say we all do, is we try to find out what does the resident want? What is their, what's their intimacy need? What is their intimacy level? What is it? And we start there. Then we go to the staff and we ask, uh, what assessments have been done? kind of back to what I said about the assessment should be done. And we all, I always ask who made this decision about the person and their intimacy needs. And if I get that it is a single staff person saying and dictating, then I will advocate for assessments to be done, uh, the whole team to come together. I will ask the resident if they want me to be a part of that meeting. And if they say I can be a part of that meeting, then I'm gonna be there to advocate for that resident to have their rights um, listened to at least. Um, and I'm gonna do everything I can to, to advocate for the, the resident, uh, their wishes to be known. But I'm always gonna start with the resident to see if I can determine in conversation with them, what are they wanting? Thank you so much. And, I'm, and it's such a great benefit to have an ombudsman like yourself, uh, just to really advocate for the residents and the family. Well, I have a question for you. We have some great questions popping up in the chat. So I'm gonna throw you to two more questions and then we're gonna get to these questions because we wanna try to get to as many questions as we can within this time frame. Just a disclaimer for everyone. Um, if we're not able to get to every question today as time permits, uh, my colleague Kelly Wilmore will be uh, putting Holly and AG's information in the chat. So if you'd like to follow up with them specifically for more specific questions that we just don't have the time to answer today, um, you can definitely follow up with them. So please be looking for that and some other resources that will be in the chat as well. So Holly, my next question to you is, uh, what tips would you give maybe children, sibling, other close relatives and care partners who are really struggling with connecting with their loved one with dementia, i.e. affection, quality time, you know, emotional awareness, which you know is, is severely impacted um, as someone has a diagnosis. Right. Well, Jane touched on so many good points and she had mentioned um, what we call compassionate touch, uh, being able to touch in a way 
for just a minute, let's think just a second about what's happening. Whenever somebody is um, a child, whenever somebody is uh, three, four years old and they are hurt or they are scared, what do we do? We hold them, we touch them, we rock, we pat, we stop doing that. And as this disease progresses, we tend to do it less and less and that's when they need it more and more. They are going back to who they were, who they've always been. And we've always been that person who needs that positive touch. And right now we're living in a time of touch deprivation. We know that because of the last year that we've had. So we encourage everyone. It doesn't matter your relationship to them. It doesn't have to be their partner. We're talking about uh, intimacy with friends and with adult children, with their parents, using that compassionate touch. It's all about making the connection. They need that. How do we know they need it? Because we know that their amygdala stays intact. There has been so many studies done to show that after a person with dementia passes away, regardless of what type of dementia they have, that hippocampus is going away, those facts are going away. Uh, like she said earlier, you know, those words, you know, what is this thing or this stuff, but the feelings and emotions remain. And that's amazing that even after they may have a flat affect on their face, they are there. We know they're there because their amygdala is intact. So what does that mean? That means that they are going to respond to tone of voice, gestures, body language, and touch. So for adult children, for partners, for friends, I encourage you to palm to palm, palm to palm. Um, it doesn't even have to be a massage. Massage is fine, but holding hands, especially if you're doing a rhythmic type pat or touch, because think of what rhythm is or rocking, that's self-soothing. And if you're doing that with them, that's self-soothing. Maybe doing a um, movement on their back, a very light or soft movement on their back remembering to never use the word remember. I'm so glad we opened with communication. Um, we never say the word remember to somebody with dementia because all you're doing is reminding them that they forgot and you can trigger a challenging behavior. In fact, about 60% of the time, we trigger those challenging behaviors. We don't mean to, but we do. And then also music, music stays. We know that the left side of the brain, that left language leaves left language leaves, that's our day-to-day -day language, but right rhythmic remains, rhythm remains, because that's on the right side of the brain. Go back and use music, their music, don't use your music. You could have a challenging behavior if you use your music, use their music and sit there in quiet, sit there and listen to the music. Time doesn't mean the same thing to them either. We're the ones who want to feel the time with conversation. I have a lot of students come through and they tell me some of their favorite things to do is to sit and hold hands with residents and rock and sway. Because what are we, we're kind of dancing, aren't we? We're swaying to music and making that connection. Thank you so much. I think that's important because uh, like we said, when we think about intimacy, you know, the first thing that comes to everybody's mind is sex. Of yeah. course, that's a byproduct of intimacy, but it's important to understand intimacy is, uh, you know, just those emotional connections, those just that close, um, close relationship that you have with your loved one, whether, you know, it is a spouse or, you know, but also those family, those friend relationships. So thank you so much. I think that was a great way to cover that. And um, I'm so grateful for the wonderful work that you do with your families and the community at James L. West and abroad. AG, I'm going to ask you another question and then we're going to get into our audience question. Um, you may see, you probably see this quite a bit where, um, someone has transitioned to a senior living community and uh, it's changed the relationship between especially spouses and that loved one in the facility does not recognize uh, their spouse anymore. So the relationship is definitely impacted. Uh, how do you typically work with families to uh, address that and cope with that? Yeah, and um, Tanisha, a lot of it goes back to what 
Holly and Jane have already said as well, is we really work um, with families a lot and really suggest that they get as educated as they can about dementia, about the, and especially about the different stages so that they not only kind of understand what's going on, but even maybe what to expect potentially down the road. Um, but one of our kind of key things that we say to people all the time is, you really just need to be in their moment, in their world, as much as you possibly can. Um, and if they're not recognizing you, then you, you've got to, um, as much as you can, be okay with that. But you don't try and bring them back around to your reality of who you are. And, and it's kind of like what Holly said, you don't go the remember route at all. Um, and so we, we work with families around that. Um, and, and we just tell people to be there as much as you can to support and really watch for those possible fleeting moments where they, there may be some recognition. Um, and Holly, you're thinking about, and I always say, offer your hand, touch, comfort. I mean, I've, I've had several residents that when I've gone in to visit them, they grab my hands and we sit there and hold hands and do our visit. And I've had several people tell me, you're the only person who holds my hands. No one else will hold my hand. So um, yeah, it's just, it is hard. It, it, is, it is extremely hard. I've been through it personally where uh, my mother-in-law didn't know who I was. And then sometimes she did. Um, and it, you just have to know this was, not a, this was not a day for me. This was a day for her. And she still got the visit from me. And we still connected because we touched, touched her arm, held her hand. And, and we, we try to get families to understand that as much as possible, but it's difficult. It really is difficult. And um, a lot of times we will get families who say, you just don't understand. And that's when I, what little I can share about my own personal, I will say, oh yeah, I do understand in my context. No, I don't understand because you're in your own, but I'm at least being empathetic because I've been there in my Absolutely. part. Absolutely. Well, yeah. thank you, first of all, so much, AG, for sharing that with us, sharing your personal experience and how this really helps you connect with families. Well, that concludes our pre-selected questions. We've got some fantastic questions popping up in the chat, so I want to try to answer those as much as we can. We have about, we have about 11 minutes to answer those questions. So Kelly, I'm gonna kick it off to you if you wouldn't mind fielding those questions. I think we have some specific questions for our panelists. We do, Tanisha. We actually have five questions. Um, a few of them have been answered um, in the Q&A box, but some folks are probably not looking at that. So we're gonna go back over those again. And one second, my participant screen is covering the general chat box. Now I'm trying to get to those, one second. Okay, so uh, starting back, we got a question early on, and um, this is the question. It's, do we have a sense of the, it's kind of a two-part question, but do we have a sense of the protective factors in dementia patients due to African-American experiences of resilience, um, spirituality, or just those family and group um, community affiliations? Um, and or genetic components? And then are there unique ways of administering care for African-Americans with dementia related to, to intimacy? Um, Holly, we'll toss that one to you because I think you had some information on that. 
I did. That is very, very specific. And thank you for that question. That's a really, really good question. Um, and I'm glad you put it in early because that gave me time to get online and look up some stuff <laughs> because I, I don't have the answer to that. But I found a study, a specific study that was done for that. And it is at University Libraries Digital Collections. Um, and I went in and there is a study that was done specific looking at all of the things that you were talking about there. So I'm going to recommend um, that you look at that. So uh, that's good to know that there is research and that there's studies specific to exactly what you're asking there. Thank you, Holly. Um, we have another question for you, Holly, that came in early on. Uh, what specific part of the brain is affected um, when disinhibition, uh, more openness is presented and what can be done as social work practitioners and as caregivers to help balance that with self-control? Sure, and that is the frontal lobe part of the brain. Um, that is also where our filter is. So that's where our self-control is. I should do that, I shouldn't do that, I should say this, I shouldn't say this. And so this is where, uh, again, we're treating the disease right now by having a forum just like this. This is how we treat dementia, is by education. So as social workers, as LPCs, as anybody who works in this field, healthcare professionals, this is what we can do, is we then in turn educate these families because the more educated they are, the better they are going to be able to go on this journey with their family. This is what I spend my entire day doing, is doing support groups and talking with people one-on-one -on -one. There's no answers to this because there's no cure. We all want to be put out of a job. We would love to have to go do something else uh, by finding a cure for this, but until then, but it is, it is in the frontal lobe. It's in the frontal part of the brain. Um, I have had to even take family members before and have them look specifically at their own loved one's MRIs uh, to make, to get them to fully understand the damage that's being, that has happened to the brain. When they can really look at their own mothers, their own fathers, um, because I've had people say they're doing this on purpose. They can control it because sometimes they're there and sometimes they're not. Well, that's because sometimes there's a connection and sometimes there's not. Uh, but to actually look at their MRI and to have a professional point out to them, look at this atrophy, look at the areas of where these there's a hole there. How can we expect this person to act like someone with a three pound brain when they've got a one pound brain? So it's education. But yes, understanding what parts of the brain. So the disinhibition um, and the uh, self-control frontal lobe. Thank you, Holly. So we have two more questions. I know we have about five minutes before we get to our next section. Um, so if I have time, I'll do three. But right now I'm going to focus on two. Um, AG, this next one actually is for you. Um, accepting that we are sexual beings and um, that desires to be sexual, you know, despite having dementia or not having someone interested in them sexually, this is coming from the practitioner standpoint. Do we guide them through grieving that their sexual identity is lost or do we try to help them express it, you know, assuming that, you know, it's first stage dementia or that they, you know, minimally can recognize free will. Um, it's also a long question, but I think, I think you have it on the, the screen as well. Great question. Um, yeah, I, I, if it's early stage and they they can still tell us what it is that they are wanting or they're, how they're wanting to be sexually expressive, then it, it, that needs to be supported um, in, in any way it can be. Um, because it's not really lost yet as long as they can express it. So, and, and when I say express, I am not even talking language um, just through their actions. Again, as long as it, it's not infringing on someone else who maybe doesn't have capacity but yeah, it's, if I'm understanding the question, the way it's being pitched, it, it really is, you're, you're not grieving anything yet because the person can still tell us what they're wanting and what they're, uh, what they're needing um, as far as intimacy. 
And we just need to be able to help facilitate that any way we can, watching everybody else's rights. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we have another question, and um, either AG or Holly, you can take it. Um, and the question is uh, from someone that put, is it normal that the person with dementia just forgets how to give pleasure the way they always have? Um, you know, both individuals would like to be close, but, you know, a, a cuddle can turn into something painful, the frenzied attack and things can go, you know, wrong and frustrating conversations can happen. So um, would either of you like to touch on that or you both can share your thoughts. Uh, we have about three minutes. I, I will go real quick. I, I think what I've also experienced is just the, the reverse. People all of a sudden doing things that they have never done before um, that are catching family and, and they're like, where did that come from? What, and you know, it, again, it, it, it needs to be structured, directed and allowed but it just could be something that's been there and we never knew about it potentially. So Holly, you wanna take the other? <laughs> yeah, and then I've met kind of the other way where yes, they literally can forget how to give pleasure because it right. is not something that they've always done. So like I said earlier, we're going back to who we've always been. And there was a time in our life when we were not a sexual being. And I use the words, we're all sexual beings. We are all sexual beings. But there was a time in our life when we weren't. And they may, may be back to a point in their life where they were not. But they will always, because that amygdala is intact, they will always have feeling. They will always understand love. And they will always know compassion. So that is where we may shift more to the... Um, I'll tell you something I see an awful lot is the spooning in the bed, how we hold each other, we spoon each other in the bed. Um, because we'll have people whose loved ones have pat who their spouse has passed away and they may move in with us and they'll go get in the bed with another person just to have that someone next to them. And that's where we have to do a lot of education. Was that about sex? No. Was that about intimacy? Yes. It was. They've been laying next to somebody for 40 years like that, 50 years like that, and they still need to be able to do that. That's hard. Yeah. To and and we've, we've had calls from facilities because somebody's doing that very thing. And we've had to help them understand. Yeah. Well, thank you all for your questions. Um, Tanisha, I'm going to turn it back over to you and yeah. Kathleen. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you, AG. Thank you, Holly, for that fantastic session. Lots of great information. And once again, uh, Kelly, if you wouldn't mind putting their information in the chat, if you have specific questions that you'd like for AG or Holly to follow up with, um, please, their information is in the chat, and you are more than welcome to connect with them. Also, as a follow-up to this program, we can also send that out in a follow-up email to send out their information if you'd like to speak with them specifically and get involved in the wonderful programming and work that they are doing at their respective places of business. Thank you so much, Holly. Thank you so much, AG. Give me one second as I transition to the next session. All right, Kelly. All right, uh, Kathleen, I would love for you to talk about the wonderful work that you were doing at Seniors Blue Book. And first of all, thank you so much for being our sponsor for our CEUs this, this evening, as well as co-hosting and uh, co-sponsoring this wonderful program. Thank you so much. And Kathleen, I'll, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Tanisha, very much. So I'm Kathleen Warshawski. I'm with Seniors Blue Book. And Seniors Blue Book is a comprehensive resource guide. We have over 80 categories of resources for caregivers to use when they're helping someone that they love. 
Um, we also have our discharge planner resource notebook, and that is specific for our social workers, nurses, and case managers in the hospital and skilled nursing settings, so in the long-term care settings. Um, all of our products are free for the community. We list all of the nonprofit and government agencies, all the hospitals, all of the um, skilled nursing communities. You know, there's just a lot of great resources in there for you to help, um, whether you're, you're caregiving yourself or helping someone who is caregiving. You can pick them up at Tom Thumb, um, at Whole Foods, Market Street, a variety of places. We will be putting uh, links to view the books online in the chat for you as well. So you can actually just click on the link and flip through the book online for both of them. Um, and we, we also can search online at seniorsbluebook.com. And so we just have a lot of great resources. We also have our SVB University and we put on uh, these educational programs to help caregivers as well as social workers and nurses um, to just gain knowledge and be able to care for our loved ones in, in the community. We partner with great uh, people such as the Alzheimer's Association and the Senior Source. This is our first program with James L. West and we look forward to doing more with them as well. So I'm Kathleen with Seniors Blue Book, Resources for Aging Well. And I wanna thank you all for being here today. We also, uh, the continuing education credits will be for 1.5 hours for social workers for this program today. And we will be putting the link to that in the chat as well. As a link for our general evaluation, we do ask that you complete both evaluations if you need the CEU credit. And if you don't need the credit, just please do the general evaluation. They will remain open for 24 hours now, and then they will close and you won't be able to access them again. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you to our speakers, to AG and to Holly. I really appreciate you and Jane as well. Um, over there at the Senior Source, and then uh, to Tanisha and Kelly at the Alzheimer's Association. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Uh, it has been a pleasure working with you as always. Uh, I love working with you and just the continued work that our organizations do. I want to, first of all, once again, send out a wonderful big shout out to Kathleen Warshawski with the Senior Blue Book uh, for being our sponsor for CEUs as well as co-hosting this event, as well as James L. West, Holly Glover from James L. West and our senior source partners, Jane Hunley and A.G. Black. Thank you so much for the amazing work that you do every day. Um, I hope that this program was uh, beneficial and informative. Thank you all for attending. And once again, please check the chat before you leave. The CEU link, once again, as Kathleen stated, is uh, good for 24 hours within, uh, within this program time. So definitely you wanna get that evaluation link before you leave so that you can, if you are seeking CEUs, that you can access that survey link. And then also as a follow-up to this program, uh, we will, Kelly and I will be emailing